Hey, welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm Bruce Waller, your host, where I'm talking to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace and in the community. How did these leaders get started and what do they do to accelerate in the leadership lane? And today I'm talking to Adrienne Court. She is the Chief Human Resource Officer at Alchemy Technologies. She is also a co-author of a best-selling book, Bravely She Flies. She's also won numerous awards, uh, one in particular, the Dallas HR Executive of the Year in 2013. And she is also a speaker. And I am super excited to have you on the show today. Hey, welcome to the show, Adrienne. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, you uh, can believe about half that we're doing okay. <laughs> uh, listen, I, listen, you're busy. Uh, not only uh, have you co-authored a book, you actually have another book actually coming out yeah. called Conscious Culture, Think, Act, Connect to Inspire Uncommon business results how exciting is that yeah yeah pretty fun co-authoring it with a uh, woman uh kim zoller and we anticipate that coming out spring of 2021 that's fantastic and i know that's going to be yeah. all about culture and we're going to get into some culture today Certainly. but i want to i want to uh if you don't mind i would love for uh, you to share with the viewers and the listeners uh, just kind of a brief overview of alchemy how, how do you serve your clients Oh, great. Well, so um, Alchemy, we do, to make it very simple, we do digital banking. So uh, most likely those who are listening do not go into bank branches or very, very, very rarely, but you do most of your banking either online or via mobile app. We do not do that for the mega banks, but we help uh, the community banks and credit unions. Credit unions are nonprofit to remain competitive against the mega banks. So we have almost 170 clients and nearly 10 million users on our platform today. Um, and we're based here in Plano, Texas, uh, founded 11 years ago in August. We have about 600 alchemists working for us today. Um, and uh, so that tells you a little bit about us. One little fun thing, alchemy is actually the phonetical spelling for the word alchemy, A-L-C-H-E-M-Y. So alchemy meaning chemical magical transformation and so for us um, alchemists in medieval times and some today believe you could take ordinary metal or ordinary elements and convert ordinary metals such as lead into gold and so for us it's taking an ordinary experience and making an extraordinary uh, or gold standard experience for our alchemists our clients and our community oh wow that is that's fantastic i actually I uh, had the opportunity to tour your facility and you can just like, yeah. you can feel that uh, environment. So uh, yeah, I would love, yeah, we're going to probably talk a little bit more about that as well. So that's fantastic. Uh, I, would, cool. I would love to start the show um, just by you sharing uh, your story. What's the Adrian Court story? Like, you know, where were you born? How did you get, how did you get into HR? Share that. Yeah, so, you know, I kind of tease uh, Bruce, which is the truth, is uh, you can take the girl out of the trailer, but you can't take the trailer out of the girl. So I am truly uh, grew up in a trailer in Southern California, um, and, but I went to a, a great undergraduate school, found my way, actually had a, a, a counselor in my high school mention this school, and I applied and ended up getting accepted, a small woman's liberal arts school in Southern California. Um, and, but I had one of my first jobs, I was working for this entrepreneur and he came to me and said, Hey, Adrienne, we need a 401k plan. I'm like, what's a 401k plan. And by the way, that's well before the internet for those that are a little bit junior, those were days before that. And I had to learn what a 401k plan was called up friends and ordered booklets and implemented a 401k plan and then we needed benefits and then we needed to hire people. And next thing you know, we grew this business. And um, we ended up selling it to a very large uh, consulting firm. And so that's how I got my ground floor. It was just kind of someone brought something to me and I said, okay, let me learn and figure it out. And he, he would actually say, you're a, smart, you're a smart girl, you can figure it out. And so he just kept throwing more and more stuff to me. So that's fundamentally how I started my career in HR. I didn't even know there were such degrees back then. And I think at that time they were either only like industrial psychology or degrees in personnel. Of course, today there's so much, it's so much more robust in terms of the education you can get in, in human resources. Wow, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, what a terrific uh, person to work for. I mean, it sounds like he was a, a, even a mentor for you. 
He was. His name is Richard Kane. Yes, he was great. But I've actually had many great mentors throughout my career. And I think the most profound experience was with a company called I2 Technologies. Um, those who are long-term Dell sites will know I2, but I joined I2. had just gone public, maybe 500, 600 employees, and we grew to over 6,000 in about three years. And we had a CFO there that just kept saying, okay, do more and more. Next thing you know, I had 250 people working for me, and I had global responsibility. And yeah, it was quite phenomenal experiences. So I, people just gave me opportunities, and you, I took them. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I talk about that all the time, how, you know, a lot of times that's, that's how we grow, right? I mean, there's no, yeah. there was probably no manual for a lot of that. You were just like, let me just go figure it out, right? <laughs> that's it. Just go figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. I, I would love to, I always like to ask this question. I mean, you, you, you know, you, you're, you, you've been in, in, in HR for a long, long time in a leadership role. How, how did you, like, was there a moment like when you found your, you know me, I like to use the term find your lane, right? Was there a moment when you like found your lane, your calling, your purpose uh, for, for what you do in your career? Um, you know, I, it's interesting. I think over the last few years, I've certainly found my lane um, in terms of focusing on culture as fundamental to an organization to um, it's really how you, how you, the culture is how you connect your employees, your internal customers, and what they're experiencing and how that translates into the customer or community experience. And I really kind of just see that, saw that over the last maybe seven, eight years, how fundamentally that is important to the business and that you can actually measure that success. And so uh, that's what kind of blossomed internally in terms of me of what really inspires me in my, in my jobs and my roles. But what I can tell you is defining moment, and anybody could look at my LinkedIn, is if I'm at an organization for a short period of time, there was not a culture connection. I'm not saying that it was not, that it was a bad culture, but it was not a culture connection for me or one that I felt that I could really expand upon and help translate to the, the customer experience. So. Um, i have now in the point in my career, and sometimes I talk about this to people who are um, more junior or just starting up their career, I'm now at a point in my career where I can maybe choose where I go to a little bit more so I can actually make those defining decisions and say, this is not a match and I can move on um, versus maybe when you're more junior in your career, you don't necessarily have that you know, ability to say, you know, I'm take this, I'm out of here. Um, so I think uh, fundamentally for me, kind of having that mind shift of, uh, you know, having that experience and reputation to be able to kind of pick and choose where I work. And uh, those are, I guess, all kind of defining moments for me. Uh, but again, kind of going back to just the fundamental is, I think for me, the most inspiring part of my career is the development and champion, championing and helping coach and counsel. So that's just fundamental to me is uh, the, the developing the culture and helping it translate to a competitive differentiation. Yeah, I, uh, I love how you said how it may not have been the reason, but the connectiveness uh, was an important part. Uh, I, would, I would love to, I mean, I've got lots of questions I want to ask you, but I want to just dive right into mm -hmm. this culture um, because I know you're passionate about it. And, and I, I've always wondered, you know, <laughs> Is there, like you, I think you mentioned there's a way to measure. I mean, I, I read where Absolutely. culture makes the difference in some of the best places to work companies. Uh, there's proven results, what, you know, that they get better results. Yep. Talk, talk a little bit about that. I mean, how do you, okay. how do you measure that? So um, I'm going to talk, and this is going to be a long answer, because I think it's very important fundamentally for people to understand a few things about culture. Um, as you mentioned the book, but um, first, I think you need to really understand culture is a tangible thing. Many times people think of it as this warm and fuzzy or something you can't really define. But if you really break it down, it, it's in three simple things. It's how you think. So it's how you express your culture in its words. Right? So it's alchemy, it's um, caring collaboration, trusted accountability, um, optimistic perseverance, right? So how we describe our culture in words, okay? So that's important. Then it's how it's acted or the behaviors that are manifested internally within your organization. So 
we say what it's in words, but is it being acted out? Do your employees demonstrate caring collaboration? Do they demonstrate tested accountability? And do you do those things that are reinforced within your organization uh, that connect your employees to that and they act and behave in that way? And then culture is then translated, expressed, connected to your customers and your communities. So when you think about culture, it's how you think, act, and connect. So I'm going to give you an example, Chick-fil-A. Okay. So, um, and I love this example. It's an extreme example, but many of you can kind of think of other examples. There are plenty of fast food places that sell chicken. And many people may argue that uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or Popeye's might even be better. Or maybe people may like, might like uh, McDonald's chicken nuggets better than what Chick-fil-A offers. But yet, that, and you see it here, like lines wrapped around the building, right? And um, by the way, Chick-fil-A is uh, open less hours than their competitors. Mm -hmm. So people know they can only come in at certain times. And part of their culture is they're closed on Sundays. And it's, it's my pleasure culture. And actually, if you own, ask their franchise owners, what is their purpose of it? Their purpose is not to sell chicken, but many of them will tell you, I am developing a leadership academy in my community for the youth, right? So I am transforming my community. Those are the kind of things. Okay. So let's put it to tangible. Okay. The average revenue per store, Chick-fil-A, doubles the average revenue of its next competitor, which would be McDonald's opened less hours and closed on Sundays, and their revenue is double that of McDonald's. Do they sell anything extrinsically different? One selling fried chicken, one selling hamburgers. Are they in the same community? Yes. Can they actually hire from the same pool of people? Yes. Can they actually actually hire the same talent? Yes. But what's the difference? It's the culture and how they treat their employees, and then that is expressed to the customer experience. So when you ask, is culture tangible? Absolutely. So I've given you the definition of culture and I've given you an example, but I'll give you one more. Okay. So Alchemy is a software as a service company. So we're a technology company. Okay. And there's about 70 uh, publicly traded SaaS technology companies today. Okay. I asked our CFO to, we have a list of them, to kind of identify kind of what I'm going to say key financial metrics. Like he as a CFO would say, if I look at these metrics, Adrienne, I would say these are the better performing companies. Cool. Then what I did, and this is, do not take this as a, a purist in terms of data and analysis. So I, my little HR way. Mm -hmm. looked at their glass door ratings and a few other ratings, as well as looked at uh, things uh, in press releases about their executive teams and a few things like that, and gave them each an, an unofficial culture score on a zero to five. Okay, so five being the highest and, you know, zero being the lowest. And just purely gave them kind of in an in a objective way, tried as most objective gave these scores without really even understanding what the companies were these scores. So do you know in every single way that we um, that we sorted this data, the highest scores related to the highest performing companies in terms of highest uh, culture scores, higher performing companies based on what the CFO is. Now you might say, is it that the higher performing companies make happier people? Or is it happier employees and better culture create a better uh, financial outcome? Either way, I'd bet on I'd bet on culture. So here are people talk about warm and fuzzy. Hopefully, I've given you a definition. I've given you a great example as a consumer, and then also financial example as well. No, I mean, that's fantastic. Okay, give me that definition one more time. I want to make sure everybody's got this definition. It's think, act, and connect. It's how you think about your culture, how you express it in words. Act is how the, those words are manifested or behaved within your organization by your um, employees. And then connect or interact is how your clients and your communities um, connect with your culture. So it's how your culture has been translated to your employees. So we've all had that experience, right? So um, 
You've been on um, one of the ones, someone gave me an example. It's, I think it's Chewies.com where you order, you know, your dog supplies and all that kind of stuff. And what they do is, for example, let's say your, your dear four-legged uh, happens to pass away and you got your monthly order of your supplies. You'll call them up and say, hey, I need to, you know, terminate the, the supply order. My, my pet has died and can I return the whatever? You know what their response is? Our condolences go out to you. Please do not return this to us. Please pass this on to um, an organization that would, would enjoy using this. So, wow, don't you as a consumer go, well, I'm going to use them again. Right. I have this phenomenal experience. Um, so you can just, and there's plenty of those where you have that experience as a, as a customer um, that connects you to, and it's not always the lowest priced, right? It's the, the thing that makes you feel connected. So, again, culture, very, very important. Yeah, I, I, man, those are some great, great, great examples. And, you know, I've been to your company, so I, I know they get it. But, you know, there's probably a lot of people that are wondering, like, well, how much, like, how much work is put into that? There's got, I mean, this has got to be like, this has got to be every day, right? I mean, how long did it take to build this culture where you're at now? Right. So um, fundamentally, our culture started with our founder 11 years ago. Okay. But when I joined, uh, they were kind of the next level growth and were fearing that, uh, they might, that it might slip. So at that point is when we really articulated it in words and then we reinforced programs, everything from how we communicate internally to our, our recognition programs to our, um, how um, every, everything with respect to our, our employee benefits and things like that always circle back to our culture. And then we do test it. So we do our Alchemist engagement survey every six months. Okay. We ask them specifically, how are we doing on our six culture compounds? How are we performing as it relates to trusted accountability? How is it that we are performing related to caring collaboration so that we're keeping our eye on that? And then we then correlate that to our customer experiences. Are our customers seeing that experience from their, their feedback as well? So. Um, Hopefully that gives you a little, and it is, it's not something that is, can be just done, check the box and move on. It's no different than you're worrying about any element of your operations. That's just one area of your operations you need to be focused on. Um, and, you know, our leaders, when we receive our, our Alchemist engagement scores every six months, those that are trailing behind on those areas, we certainly do spend some time and try to understand what, what's actually you know, occurring there. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the surveys. Uh, do you share, and I'm just curious, do you share these survey results back with, with the with team members or is that kind of an Absolutely. internal? Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. What, yeah. So you don't, so uh, feedback is a gift hmm. and you must receive it as a gift. We might not always love all gifts, you know, like the granny sweater, we might not always receive it, but we appreciate the thought that she put into it, right? Um, so it, you will never have success in surveys unless you then uh, show appreciation. And then also your Grammy loves to see you wearing that sweater, right? So you're, the people that give you feedback love to see you take action and use that feedback, right? So um, we always uh, share the detail very specifically. And then we also share actions that we've taken and then each leader meets with all their teams and then they talk about them and then they take actions as well. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. So one thing that I, that I appreciate you sharing is that it start, it started with your founder and I always talk yeah. about, you know, it, it, everything, everything starts with leadership in, in our organization. Yeah. Uh, we, we talk about our DNA elements and our leadership is sharing a, a Friday flash or, or something weekly. It's something around one of those values and just keeps on. It's almost like a drip campaign yes, or yes, continues great. like that. Do you be, something to similar be. to that? We do quite a bit. I think one thing that um, is the most fundamental um, that many people forget. So for example, in our, and we're old school, we still do performance reviews here at Alchemy. So um, we do think that's fundamental uh, gift to our um, employees to be able to know where they stand. But I'll do have to share that um, everyone has the exact 
same performance review. And it's based on our six culture compounds. So it's how did I get my job done related to caring collaboration or trusted accountability or optimistic perseverance or courageous innovation or even real fun. Um, and we define these so we don't make them like they're so nearly so like real fun. Everybody kind of smirks real fun, but real fun for us is recognizing other successes. Um, celebrating uh, important milestones and giving back to our community. So like when we're having those conversations at performance reviews, did you take time to, you know, you did a great project, but did you recognize others um, as part of their contribution into that, into that project or whatever? So oh, that's, fantastic. that's a fundamental way. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and like you said, I mean, this is, this is ongoing. Are you always trying to also look at, okay, we, we have built this culture. We have all these things in place. How can we do better? Is there ever, is there that talk along the way? Always, always. You have to, even in, now that we're in the environment of, of working remotely too and COVID-19 and helping the world, you know, kind of stop the spread of COVID-19, we have to continually be rethinking and reimagining um, how we manifest our culture. Um, but we don't, um, we don't uh, move away from the, ele the fundamentals of our culture it's just how you may manifest it looks differently. So caring collaboration may look different in a remote world versus caring collaboration in a physical world. So kind of reinforcing that. And then from us, um, for example, caring collaboration during, uh, particularly the, the onset of COVID-19 was to recognize um, that our alchemists were all experiencing this in different ways. Uh, particularly as an example, let's say alchemists that have children at home that are all of a sudden they're working and they're homeschooling and they weren't prepared for this. So how do we operate to provide flexibility, but also provide a, a resource? So we created, we, we use Slack, that's our internal kind of communication channel. So we started a Slack channel. It's basically hashtag kids at home. Hmm. And we had our CTO be the first one to respond in it and say, you know, hey, these are some of the areas that I'm struggling hmm. with my kids at home. And so then we created this whole kind of dynamic chat channel from here's tips to uh, create a schedule per day or here's a, a great snack to here's a picture of my kids or here's, you know, all the, here's a great pediatrician, whatever it is. And so it's this very robust. Um, channel. We have one for four-legged. So we have hashtag doggos where people that have um, their four-legged at home and the challenges and the fun things they're doing. In fact, we, 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 had a, we have two dogs, but we adopted a dog um, during COVID and it was through um, hashtag doggos that there's one of our uh, alchemists is a foster, um, does fostering and had shared about a dog and then I connected with her. And so we kind of create that we have a, a, a cooking guild so we have people share their cooking and they share mm -mm. pictures. And then we, um, during, um, during COVID, um, we uh, brought in some celebrity chefs to do, um, you know, Zoom uh, cooking together to create that cross collaboration. So we're not so siloed. So all those things, but we still are held to, you know, high accountability to serving our clients. Um, yeah, so hopefully that gives you some idea how we had to rethink and reimagine our culture in a virtual world. Yeah, I actually had Annie Carolla. She's the uh, director of global talent acquisition for HKS on a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about the importance. Oh, uh -huh. She talked about the importance of you still have to provide that, like that customer experience, that employee experience, uh, whether whether it's in a uh, virtual world or 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 in in the office. It's trying to figure out how can yeah. we continue to provide that experience, right? I'm just curious yeah. about you. Have you uh, had to, I mean, let's just kind of shift here with COVID. Have you had to shift your leadership uh, in any way over the last six months um, now that we have more people probably working from remote? Yes. So um, I am a person who connects in a physical way. Um, okay. And so that was, was, has been a, a difficult transition um, for all of us, right? So mm -hmm. kind of we're been sharing best practices and tips among ourselves, and we do a lot of learning. I have to tell you, I've actually never stopped coming into the office. So even day one, um, I wanted to ensure that there was someone here in the building. 
um, I learned a lot of new skills. <laughs> so I know we had FedEx. I didn't know how to do a FedEx. I knew we had a mail room, but I didn't know quite where the mail was. So I learned all those things. Uh, we have, although we're fully um, on AWS, so we're in the cloud, we do have a few um, kind of internal servers. So I learned how to check the temperature in our server rooms and go in the bathrooms, make sure we don't have leaks. Um, but with that, uh, we had to figure out ways um, because when you're in an office, you just naturally have those sidebar conversations. You talk about your kids, your dogs, your life, what you did this weekend. So you do have to take more, be more intentional during these type of meetings to connect and ask versus just getting to business, which I, I can be kind of a D. We're, we're disc people here, so I'm a D. So I have to kind of learn to be a little bit more like, oh, I want to, you know, spend more time kind of connecting um, in, a, in a virtual world. Um, and we've done some fun games and things and, you know, certainly a few uh, video uh, happy hours and things like that to stay connected. But like a lot of our um, internal training was always on, uh, was always on um, in person. We had to rethink and reimagine how that those happened. And it couldn't be just two hours in a video. So we had to think of things that were dynamic and tools that could reverse, you know, ways to create, kind of create an experience. So. Yeah, you have to rethink a lot as leaders, a lot. I love how a you lot. talk about rethinking and reimagining. I've talked to a couple of leaders that they canceled their internship programs, but yet online I saw where you had a great uh, 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 internship uh, experience. But, but was this, so you did that virtually, right? Um, was this a first? Yeah. And how so, did that go? Yeah. I, yeah, so yeah, a couple of fun things we have to share. So um, yes. Um, Again, kind of um, part of our trusted accountability. Uh, when I mentioned, you know, all our culture compass, one of ours is trusted accountability, and one of that is staying resolute to our commitments. Mm. And so, with a summer internship program, we knew we had to stay resolute to that commitment, but we had to rethink and reimagine it. I would say um, that it certainly was not as experiential had we um, had it in person. But we did feel we needed to remain committed to those students. We wanted, didn't want to disappoint them. And we still had plenty of work for them to do. So our team had to kind of rethink, reimagine, reengage. And so we had a fully virtual um, um, uh, inter summer internship program. One other thing I just want to share, which was super cool. Um, we do this thing with Bold Idea, which is a mm -hmm. mentoring program that we bring in a middle school and high school students to engage them in getting the love for coding and technology. And our alchemists, about 25 of our alchemists mentor, uh, um, volunteer to mentor these students. Well, it's always done very physically and you know, work environment and all that kind of stuff. And uh, within two weeks, our alchemists volunteers were able to move that to virtual, give these kids a virtual experience, figure out all the logistics. And we were the only Bold Idea location that was able to do that. The others had canceled. And then they used us as a best practice for um, starting out this semester with these kids. So I have to give it a huge, again, kind of that resolute in our com commitments translates into our community um, things as well. Yeah, that's, wow, that's fantastic. And what a great opportunity for for your team members to be able to uh, to do, be able to mentor and, and, and really grow in their leadership too. I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah. But it's not, I'm not, I mean, you know, I say all these, these success stories, it's not easy. I mean, this is a lot. Um, people are tired. Um, many feel isolated. Um, the struggles with children at home, um, the feeling on time all the time. So when you were, with providing more flexibility make extends people's days as well. So let's say someone has children at home, so their, their manager certainly gives them flexibility maybe to start the day at noon. So now they're working from noon to eight, but their team members are maybe working to eight to five, but yet they're still connecting with them. So it's like kind of figuring out all those dynamics is, it, it's a lot. It's I'm, a lot. I'm, I'm so I don't want to make it sound all like roses and yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you. I'm glad you sh I know. I'm glad you shared that because I think there's a lot of people that are. I mean, we got to. You know, we're. I think we're all. Tr you know, trying to figure out how to navigate through this new world of work, and 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 many of us are doing a great job. But we're. Yeah, you're right. I see. I hear a lot of people talking about. Um, I'm going to use the term leadership fatigue. Uh, we, you know, we're we're tired. You know, and we're trying to figure yep. out. You know, how can we continue 
to uh, just create you know, create. And I, I love the, the words you're talking, you're using, like rethink, reimagine, uh, you know, refresh, like how do we continue to like, look at different ways to, um, to lead in our companies. And so th these are some yeah. great examples, but I appreciate you sharing that because I think that's important. I will tell you, for me, I've, I've shared this with many people that, you know, for me, transition was a big uh, challenge for me because many, you know, before, uh, you know, I was going from meeting to meeting. I was going from my office to see a client. And then I was going to see, Dal you know, Dallas HR, listening to podcasts along the way. And then all of a sudden it, it just, I had to just figure it out, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh. Right, yeah. uh, so no, that, that's fantastic. Well, I, I tell yeah. And even the, the kinetic, kinetic movement for our bodies. And certainly, these are, I mean, everyone has different businesses. So even in your business, while you might be working, you still have folks that are physically moving people from one home to another home, et cetera. But um, when you think about it, we're just sitting here and chatting with each other. I mean, even if we were just having meetings, we'd be normally moving and being kinetic mm -hmm. and up and down. So the, the physical well-being, so important. So we, we've really put the uh, pedal to the metal and emphasizing um, our the wellness and well-being of our alchemists and just reinforcing. And actually, we're having our virtual health flair next week. Um, but uh, just reinforcing, reimagining um, for our alchemists to remain healthy um, and taking care of their bodies. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I know you are, but I, I, I try to walk 10 to 15,000 steps a day, um, really focus on what I'm eating because we just don't have that that kinetic movement like we would naturally have. So no, I, I, I appreciate that. And you know, when you talk moving, uh, that's near and dear to my heart because that's what we do. Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, move people. And, and I'll tell you, uh, this, is, uh, we're, this is actually going to play in October. Uh, but uh, last week, we actually had Van Operator Appreciation Week. That's where we recognize our drivers. They're on the front line. Oh, trying, yeah. You know, they, you know, uh, and, and so it's, it's tough. And drivers have to really think about their health too, because they sit behind the wheel and you have to really think about the best, you know, best way to keep them going and mot motivated for their health too. No, that's right. That's exactly right. I want to just touch uh, real quick. I know you have a book coming out. What, when is that, when is that actually going to be coming out? We're, we're focusing uh, uh, spring of 2021. 2021. Oh, how so, exciting. Still a lot of work to do. And uh, we started writing it last year. And then in the context of COVID, um, and also at, in the in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's just a lot of things and how fundamentally important uh, culture is to that. So we kind of have to kind of reframe. And we're really thinking of it in the context of those things as well and bringing in examples that we might not have really thought when we were first writing this book. So a um, lot to do. Uh, we have our publisher um, and has us on a schedule. If it slips, it slips. We'd rather, you know, be the, you know, the right thing. But uh, yeah, that's our focus is for um, spring of 2021. Oh man, I'm excited about that because you're, you're basically saying, Hey, look, we want to get it right. We're not in a hurry. We just want to put something out there that will provide value. And, and during this time, it's probably been good to pause and just kind of take a look at, you know, what's going on in the world. It's obviously changed. Um, how does that affect culture and how can we help yep. people through that? Yeah. Yep. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Oh man. Um, I want to just uh, real, real quick, I, I, you know, life in the leadership lane, I always like to just ask, you know, you, you've worked for some great leaders, great, great leaders, many different companies. I, would you just share a few common threads that you see, uh, are in great leaders that help, you know, with, with, you know, with high performing teams. So, um, there is no one personality. So I'm going to say that. So I've worked for, when you think of disc or anything like I've worked for D's, I've worked for C's. Um, and, um, but I do think there's a commonality, um, among what I would say ones that are most successful ones that are open to learning and understanding and also um, willing to say, hey, I made a mistake. And then also to demonstrate appreciation for team. Um, I think those are really fundamental strings of leaders that I work well with and I see uh, tend to have uh, good success. Kind of like that lower ego um, 
uh, on the on the spectrum. So I think those are some of the key things that I think about um, uh, great great leaders. I, I love how you shared uh, that with, uh, you know, th there's, there's, there's a different, I mean, there's, you can have all these different leaders that have success. Uh, everybody kind of has their own way, right? It's not just, okay, here's the leader. Here's all the common traits. Now you just need to go and be like that. It's just not like that. Yeah. Right. That's fantastic. Um, I, I would just, um, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, we've talked about culture. We've talked about, you know, leadership. I want to talk about leading you and, and leading Adrienne. Um, leadership's every day. I mean, it's tough. You, you know, you were talking about how, especially going through the times we're going through now, and not every day uh, is probably like it was pre-COVID. Uh, but I was just wondering if you could share, what are some, you know, what's some daily practices that you have that keep you on track every day you know what, what's what's life like from the time you get up till the time you call today <laughs> a life in the day of adrienne yeah so um you have to kind of keep in mind we're just like you we all have we're out more than just work so i have this and then i have two teen two, two teenage children one's preparing for college the other one um actually just got a full full ride scholarship hockey offer which is exciting that's exciting. one of things but then I also have my mother that lives with us at home um, and then I'm writing a book and then I have a tribe of friends so you know there's community so we all we are all those things um, and uh, but for me some of the fundamentals and it really it doesn't relate to work or it's just me is I make sure I take care of my body um, particularly being over 50 I find that it's becoming more and more important to ensure you're taking care of your temple your body so i i make it really a goal every day i only take one day off um to get a 12 to 15 thousand steps in every day um typically that's up in the morning i'll go do that and people say what do i listen to i i really try to keep my brain clear i will listen to a little bit of music um actually i'll find, sometimes even listen listen to stand-up comedy um, just things I know everybody's like what profound thing are you listening to <laughs> like people see me laughing <laughs> radio.com comedy they have like one minute excerpts of the, some of the funny I think funny you know mm. from old school to current comedians um, just to kind of have that chill factor um, and relief uh, both for my bo mind body and spirit so that's something I do every day I mean rare that I don't Wednesdays might be the only day I take off. People ask why Wednesday. Um, it's just in the middle of the week. And sometimes I'd like to have a little chill and maybe uh, we'll go out to dinner or something as a family on Wednesdays. No, I appreciate in the non-COVID. So, yeah. 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 No, I appreciate you sharing. I, 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 I try to talk to, you know, whenever I'm doing a lot of presentations about uh, leadership development, it all starts with us. We got to take care of ourselves. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, and, and we all have our different ways. Like you're, you know, six days a week, you get your steps in. I'm three days a week with my workouts. And then I do some different um, things as well. And so, um, that, no, that's great. I would love for you to share some advice that you were given in just sometime in your career that it was so good that you share that with others. Can you think of anything? Yeah, um, there's a, a couple. Um, the first is um, many of us are leaders or managers of people will tend to focus on uh, people on their weaknesses. You know, Bruce, this is the area that you're weakest. Instead, really just exploit the strengths, recognize the weaknesses, but exploit the strengths. It's very difficult. People can learn and maybe be aware of their weaknesses, but many times that's hard to change. So for me as a leader is exploit the strengths and be aware of the weaknesses. I think that's a very important one. Um, I think the other thing early on in my career, as I kind of mentioned, but um, I think when the door closes, you find a window to break and go that way too. So um, you just, um yeah you need to find a way and sometimes it's not just the way right out the front door so you have to find alternative ways to to make it happen 
The other thing too that I find one more is um, a lot of times we just get caught in the cycle of, uh, you know, the projects, getting it done. And um, I call it OTL, over the line. Get it 85% there and get it over the line instead of just waiting for something to be perfectly done. It will never be perfect. But I find many times leaders get stuck trying to, like, sometimes you just need to get things over the line and make them happen. And then you're fixing the tire maybe the rest of the way on the track. Um, but sometimes you just have to hit the gas and just start going. Oh man, I love that. Man, this is pure gold for all of you listening and watching. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what window am I going to break this afternoon? Because yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is fantastic. Sometimes oh my gosh. Have to break some windows. That's right. Or oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we're coming uh, to the last few minutes of the, uh, of, the, yeah. of the episode. And so I like to call it, it's time to accelerate. And so I'm going to ask you just a few questions. First question is, uh, would you rather read a book or listen to a podcast? I know you talked about listening to music and comedy earlier. Book, book. or podcast? Read a book. book. Read a book. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Hey, how about a favorite food? Favorite food? Yeah. Avocados. Every way. I'm a plant-based eater, so avocados are a pretty important uh, part of my diet. I love avocados. Oh, me too. Avocado all the way. I love it. Uh, how about a um, a favorite place that I mean? Do you travel? Do you travel a whole lot? Is there a favorite place that you visited, or is there a place on your bucket list? Okay, um, so my all time absolute favorite place in the world is Laguna Beach, California. Mm. Um, it's in my heart. It's in my soul. I grew up not too far from that, um, but uh, in Texas, Port Aransas, all the way. Love four day. Mm. Love it, love it, love it. Nice. Very and good. I think it kind of goes a little to my, my grassroots of just, you know, it, it, you come as you are, you go as you are, and you just hang out as you are. So I love it. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. No I got, pretenses. I got two left. Uh, here's, here's a question for you. What energizes you? Bruce Waller, you energize me. When you send me a text and say something so caring and thoughtful you energize me how about that oh uh, you're the best that's true. thank you so much that, that's fantastic okay <laughs> here's the last question and this is a question i love asking all of my guests and, and here's the question adrian uh -oh. 10 years older is knocking at your door today uh-huh what's she telling you oh she's telling me uh you did the right thing mm. taking care of your body <laughs> doing the things you enjoy and she's also going to say i'm just loving continuing to share why um think act and connecting your culture is so important with so many organizations and you did a, you did the right thing adrian i think that's i'm hoping that's what she'll say that is so good oh my gosh that is so good. thank you so much i listen i appreciate you sharing your wisdom your perspective if someone wanted to like learn more about alchemy or get or, or follow you how is the best way they could connect LinkedIn, easy, easy. LinkedIn all the way. Love Find me it. on LinkedIn. LinkedIn all the way. Easy. Yeah. I cannot wait for your book to come out. I, oh man, I'm so excited about that. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you again, coming on the show, sharing your perspective, talking culture. I know it's going to help a lot of people out there. And I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you. Appreciate you, Mr. Waller. <laughs>